uh, Kenneth Lam and Fiona for putting this together in such a short time frame. I think it's a great honor that uh, we have invited Linus Neumann tonight here, uh, our dear friend from Deutschland, Germany, to share with us on hacktivism and also the challenges of maintaining a free and open internet in Germany. After the sharing, uh, we will have a panel discussion conducted by members of the Internet Society of Hong Kong and some developers, and also Linus. So you can direct your questions if you have, a, if you have any after, after the panel discussion, uh, which comes to Q&A session. So without further ado, let's welcome Linus. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here. I'm uh, flattered to be uh, invited. I have uh, I did not expect many people to come. Um, that is why I did not ex uh, You need to turn it around. Yeah. There we go. So today I uh, want to tell you a little bit about the, the German free internet scene activities um, and how we have so far uh, struggled to maintain an open internet um, and I hope that by telling you some of the stories that we have experienced in Germany I can um, I can get you to the uh, show you some of the um, share some of the lessons that we have learned in Germany um, I will just basically just speak a little bit and whenever you uh, you have a question or you want to add to a comment or something just please just quickly raise your hand and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take questions as whenever they come so <clears throat> this is a, a little story from my experience as a representative of the German uh, Chaos Computer Club but not only as a representative of the Chaos Computer Club I have been uh, working as a journalist before, I'm currently working as an IT security consultant um, and I have been an activist for uh, probably the longest part of my life. So whenever in this uh, presentation I say we, I uh, mean a lot of people in, in the German scene in general and I'm looking at uh, the proceedings and the stories out of the perspective of the Chaos Computer Club. So, who has heard of the Chaos Computer Club before here? Very few people? Yeah, so that's good because I have prepared a couple of slides on, <laughs> on what the uh, Chaos Computer Club is. So, uh, Chaos Computer Club, uh, as you can tell, doesn't really uh, refer to a, a very complicated or large organization. Um, the Chaos is already in the name, so it's a very a loose tie of hackers and activists in Germany. At the moment we're counting something like uh, 5,000 members, give or take a few. Um, and we have about 30 or 28 um, hack spaces uh, in the German-speaking area. So that would be Austria, Germany and Switzerland that feel affiliated with the Chaos Computer Club. But where did it all start? So, I think the Chaos Computer Club started in a time when computers looked basically like this. So this is more than 30 years ago. Uh, the first computer interface that I looked at looked like this. Uh, some of you probably know it. It's a Commodore uh, 64. That was what got me started on computers. So this goes way back. And back in these days, a couple of um, or maybe even before that, before the uh, Commodore 64. A couple of people um, from a left-wing liberal um, movement in Germany thought about the future. And they were good at thinking about the future and they, force, they could foresee many of the questions that um, are obvious to our societies nowadays but, not, uh, but were not really obvious to people back in those days. So when they saw uh, 
a, co a telephone that they could hook up a computer uh, to and em envision that all computers could one day talk to each other. They knew what was going to um, happen on, you know, in, in terms of technology, but they also knew what that this was going to have very important consequences for society. So this idea of having computers talk to each other, uh, by now I guess the best uh, example are these phones, you don't even have a wire anymore and the computer is very small, not as large as the one over there that our founder, Vau Holland, connected to, um, to a phone booth there. Um, they knew that this was going to have significant consequences on our society. So they thought about these consequences and they did so in a club and eventually in a congress, a national congress in Frankfurt with a couple of hundred inhabitants. And this is the, the congress poster from 1988 and that is the German, the largest uh, TV sh uh, news show in Germany in 1984, uh, already debating that the hackers are meeting in Hamburg uh, in basically primetime news. So from the very beginning when hackers united in Germany, um, they got quite some media attention. Um, but you don't get media attention for free. Uh, when you're a hacker, every once in a while you have to hack something. So we do that. Um, here you see, which is one of the most famous um, hacks that was ever uh, played out by the CCC. Um, the so-called BTX hack. So BTX was basically a predecessor of the, of the internet in Germany. And it would allow you to to do what you would consider uh, paid content watching, whatever. I mean, it didn't really have much functionalities, but it had a beautiful functionality of being able to access um, banking information. And it had a beautiful idea that you could be charged for watching a site. So instead of um, you know a website being open, I could have a website that would cost like say nine euros on nine US dollars per uh, page impression, which was a beautiful idea at the time. And by some hacking, they managed to charge a German bank uh, with about 130 something thousand Euro, uh, Deutschmarks at the time um, and conducted, I think, one of the first online bank robberies, uh, so to say, in, in Germany. And uh, next day they came back with the money and gave the money back, of course. We, uh, yeah. And that, that's what people found even more crazy. So that's how you make uh, the news again and again. So they had um, quite, some, quite a reputation for their technological skills and um, continued from there. Now, I already said they not only did they <laughs> seeing some people again. Not only did they, um, did they give the money back, um, they also had a set of ethical principles around giving the money back. And that is what we call uh, the hacker ethics. And this is what I think most of the German internet activist scenes uh, beliefs are based on. There may be some people that have different views on certain aspects, but most people in Germany, at least the activists, I, I think corporate Germany has a completely different view, uh, would agree that access to computers and anything that might teach you about the way the world works should be unlimited and total. So knowledge should be free and most information should be free. Um, and I think there's a very clear or very simple explanation for that. Um, if you make this available to, or if you make all information or all knowledge available to everybody in your country or maybe everybody in the world, everybody will also benefit. So if you know something that you want to know and you have some expertise in some field, um, then sooner or later society is going to benefit from that. And I am part of that society and I want to benefit from you having um, 
free access to information and knowledge. It's not really, I mean, I can, I can make a completely selfish argument for that. And I'm, I'm making a selfish argument here. Of course, there are other implications of that, and that is if information is not free, if knowledge is not accessible to everybody, um, then everybody suffers, and the larger part of the society, of the society suffers when you make knowledge uh, unavailable to people. Um, one of the, and here you see the liberal roots of the Chaos Computer Club, is mistrust authority and promote decentralization. Um, at that point in time, I, I think it was not as obvious to see as it is nowadays that any system will always tend towards a centralization. Whatever you have, a society system, uh, a computer system, everything will work towards a centralization. So you have a computer with a central uh, processing unit, you have a society with a central authority, or uh, several central balanced authorities. And whenever you have an authority or a central part, you have a single point of failure and a single point of power. And both of these uh, we try to avoid. So decentralization from a system architect's perspective is just uh, making things stable and fail-safe and making them able to, you know, um, live with a couple of, of errors or failures and just route around them and just repair them and ignore them. And you wouldn't build a transportation system in a central manner, but uh, you would build a decentralized uh, transportation system and the same we think is true uh, or should be done for the flow of information. Um, one thing that was, I'm, I mean to my generation it's obvious, but to many generations before us it probably wasn't, uh, you shouldn't judge people by degrees, age, race, sex, or position, but simply by what they do. Um, and that is, um, yeah, I think it's quite obvious to me nowadays, but there is always a couple of people that you need to remind of that. That's a very, uh, very sad thing. But it also means that um, we are valuing our members based on their contributions and that is um, to some people also a very exclusive position right saying like what have you ever done uh, you're not we're not going to listen to you so that that also uh, creates an entry barrier and this entry barrier has problems if knowledge is not distributed evenly in society because then it means you have an automatic tendency to build uh, some kind of um, elites um, and we, we just want to become better as a whole, as a society. You can create art and beauty on a computer. Well, yeah, I think it's obvious nowadays, but uh, back in the days when computers looked like this, I think that was quite a visionary idea as well. Um, computers can change your life for the better. That is also an interesting aspect. Um, a lot of um, liberals in Germany, when computers came up, envision them as tools for suppressing people, tools for uh, categorizing people, tools for suppressing a whole society. And um, the hackers thought, well, you know, those are beautiful machines and we can do a lot of crazy things with them. And if they are, if they are weapons, they might as well be our weapons. And it turned out that for a couple of decades, uh, at least we maintained these weapons. Do not mess around in other people's data. Um, from a hacker organization, that might sound like a very interesting idea. Um, most hackers do nothing but messing around in other people's data. And uh, I, wouldn't, <coughs> I wouldn't argue that all of our members uh, always uh, follow this rule. You know, every rule has its exceptions, but in general, uh, this is a, an ethic principle that we do not only uh, hold up for ourselves, but that we also ask others to follow. And the final one, and that is I, probably the most cited one uh, from the hacker ethics, is that public data should be used and private data should be protected. And this addresses directly um, the, uh, the relationship between the state and its individuals, right? We want to protect the individuals from the state. Um, they can maintain their own private data, 
but we want to see that the state is as transparent as possible to the individuals just as a matter of um, balancing and controlling the state. Um, a few people have made an attempt in uh, translating these, uh, but mind you, I know not what I'm showing there, so uh, sorry, I didn't mean to uh, insult anybody in the room or outside of the room, um, but I have been told that this is correct, so I hope it is. And here's another one. <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to insult you either. So, it's <laughs> so where, did, where did these, basically this little set of principles and a couple of hacks, I, I'm, I'm um, leaving out a lot, of, a lot of the CCC's history here, where did this lead in, in 30 years? So this picture was taken probably last year or the year before, and that is our annual congress with about 12,000 visitors every year that we hold between uh, Christmas and New Year in December in, uh, in Germany. And it's grown into quite a colorful uh, um, thing that we're doing there, and most people that go there for the first time uh, would say that they have um, imagined hackers to be more boring than that. So we are, we're proud of a very colorful um, and fun community and a creative community. This is uh, lecturing hall one, which holds about uh, three and a half thousand people. And this is just one of our uh, four to five um, halls that we do lectures in. We're also doing a uh, camp every four years. That's because camps are way more complicated. Uh, than congresses, um, which is also quite colorful and beautiful. This is a live picture during a thunderstorm that, uh, that hit us last year in August when we had the camp. So we are running quite huge conferences and camps for, for activists, for, for hackers, for technologists, and for those who want to learn and participate from their knowledge. And every once in a while we found, find ourselves as ex expert witnesses to the Supreme Court or to the German government. Here you see me explaining uh, why a certain um, IT security system is not secure in the German parliament. I was doing my best. And uh, we are maintaining these, this, I think, unique mixture between um, being chaotic and experts at the same time. So um, if you look at uh, my little microphone that I had here, I couldn't resist leaving this sticker um, this, uh, portraying the microphone in the German parliament as being a device that's monitored by the National Security Agency uh, very much later. I wasn't uh, even sure anymore whether that was maybe even the case. So we've grown into a group of hackers and we are serious about it. We do, we do this all the time. This is what holds us together. This is our common denominator. Um, we're also a group of internet freedom activists. The internet freedom activism is not, a net, not necessarily part of being part of the CCC. We've also grown into this, you know, maybe we've taken this activism a bit further into lobbyism where when, you, you know, when you're not only st standing in the streets anymore, but also you know, testifying in courts and testifying in, in parliaments and trying to, to um, propose legislation, you sooner or later a lobbyist. I don't consider myself one, but we have some. We're hosting these uh, several thousand people events every year, and we are a loose connection of around 30 hacker spaces. So there is no, not one single answer to what the CCC is. If you ask me, we're a hacker club. But there are lots of other organizations in Germany as well, and I'm, I don't have them all on here, um, but I'm displaying some of the important ones, which is uh, Netzpolitik.org, which I will get back to later, which is an independent uh, news outlet in Germany dealing only with uh, news on uh, technology and the internet, and freedom of the same. Um, Digitale Gesellschaft is a lobbyist organization, um, so basically an attempt not to, um, you know, if you're, if you're a hacker, you can only speak for so and so many cases and so and so many causes, and they're not going, you know, for some other aspects, you just need some good lawyers to, um, to, to make good arguments that are better than uh, information must be free and 
<laughs> so you need you need lawyers that can actually argue with uh, legislators. So we founded the the, the Di Digitale Gesellschaft, which roughly translates to um, Internet Society or Digital Society. There was also a chapter in German activism history when we had a party, the Pirate Party. Um, officially, I think it's still in existence. Um, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's been a sad um, story because this new party, when you whenever you found a new party and this party is suddenly very popular, you get a lot, you attract a lot of people, and then you are in a in a you are in this crazy conflict between being open to everybody and um, in this crazy conflict of trying to be a grassroots organization and on the other hand having maybe a couple of hundred or thousand idiots in your party that can speak longer than you. Um, and then uh, this is where demo democratic um, groups always get into some kind of trouble because either you need to, you know, be exploited, and I think this is what happened to the Pirate Party, or you need to apply some kind of principle that is just not very liberal or basic democratic, which is also not a good thing to do. So um, I think the, one of the healthy things about the Chaos Computer Club is that it grew very, very slowly, so we could always um, make sure that we, we didn't get uh, too many uh, crazy people into, into our club. Um, Digital Courage is a data protection group, um, used to be called differently in Germany and has also has a similarly long history in Germany. So roughly the CCC as, as the root of where liberal activism for the internet and a lot of technological expertise meet. And now I'm I'm just going to walk you through a couple of things that happened in, uh, in Germany in the past 10 years that I would consider um, fundament attacks on fundamental rights of, of digital citizens. And I would like to just briefly introduce the matters. In the, okay, yeah, yeah. Took, took me took me a time. Um, yeah, so it's a fight against censorship, the fight against mass surveillance, uh, the fight against uh, state trojans, and then finally the fight against going to jail for treason, uh, which is which is more of a joke here. But of course, censorship, sen oh, it's getting it's starting again. Censorship and mass surveillance are, um, you know, the biggest challenges that we're facing at the moment, um, and that. Not only Germany, but also, I mean, all of the world is facing a constant threat of censorship all the time. And I guess mass surveillance, um, we don't really need to talk about in uh, the city where Edward Snowden first sought uh, refuge. So here is Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, at the time, by now she is uh, the minister of uh, um, she's the head of the military, I don't know, Ministry of Defense is what, what we call it. Because, you know, military is only there to defend you. Uh, that's why you have weapons. Um, so the, she at the time was the ministry, Minister of, of Family. And she thought it was a wonderful idea to, uh, to create these, uh, this blocking infrastructure for the internet. Uh, where when you would access an undecent site, you would be displayed with a, a stop sign and they would explain to you that uh, you are trying to access uh, indecent material. Um, indecent in this case is um, documented child abuse. So I think we all agree that that is an indecent thing and we don't, we don't really want that on the internet. And it's very comp or it's very hard to argue against that. So if, if your government says, hey, you know, let's Let's really bl let's block the really you know disgusting and illegal parts of the internet. Then what are you going to do? I mean, it's very hard to argue against this. But our argument was, when you block something and people can't access it anymore, how do they know what you're blocking? What is the what is the transparency here? 
Um, so we had a we had some demonstrations in Berlin and other cities of the world, and then uh, in other cities of Germany, um, and then. Mr. Gutenberg, a, a different minister at the time, um, really, you know, started the attack on us. And that is, I'm very concerned that there are people who resist the blocking of child pornography. This is really one of our key projects in many ways. And at that point in time, we were um, arguing against censorship. And now, if you're, if you're, let's say, at that point in time, I was probably like 20, 25 years old, and if you're talking to your mother and you say, you know, mom, I'm fighting against censorship, and then your mother would say, <clears throat> listen, my son, uh, there are some things in the world that um, I'd rather have censored. Um, so it was very, very hard to win this argument. Um, but we did, and how did we do it? So first of all, this was, this was a law that was, was sooner or later in effect. And it was based on a contract between the government and internet providers. And there were secret blocking lists. And um, the blocking lists would cover sites that contain illegal material or sites that link to illegal material. And if you would uh, access uh, such, a, um, such a site, the, the stop symbol that you saw there would also be tracking you. So the government would basically notice, ah, he tried to access this material. And that is, of course, a very um, dangerous uh, threat there, um, especially when we're talking about uh, illegal material. So this is uh, something with, that people would go to jail for, just um, possessing this material. Um, and But on top of that, they were trying to use circumventable blocking mechanisms. Um, I think you all know that if somebody tries to keep you from accessing something on the internet, most of the time you find a way around it, and that was the same here as well. So what argument can you make against this? You could, you know, if you say, hey, your, your blocking mechanism is not really uh, effective, well, that's not really an argument because it's going to keep most of the people outside. So the argument we actually settled for was, why do you not prosecute the offenders and take the sites offline? send the police, you know, notify the people hosting the materials, hosting the servers, and tell them to take the thing offline. And when you ask to, when you talk to the providers, to the uh, uh, hosting providers, they can tell you who rented that server and you have a lead. So instead of uh, prosecuting people, you're trying to just, um, to just uh, put a curtain in front of them and let them commit their crimes in peace. Um, and that argument, indeed, in the end, proved so strong that we managed to, to, to put an end to this uh, idea. So we had an online petition with 128,000 um, signatures. That may sound like a very small number to you, but in Germany that was the most successful online petition ever, I think, uh, at least to the, at that point. And we actually forced the government into a strategic retreat so there was never any blocking in Germany, and they actually repealed the law. So even though in public opinion it started as an absolutely lost cause, we managed to convince um, the majority of people and in the end the government not to set up this censorship uh, system. And this is, I think, still one of our biggest uh, successes. But if I were a dictator, I'll be honest, I wouldn't censor anything because I know that this will get a lot of people mad and that's not to the benefit of my own economy. But what I would do is a lot of surveillance. And that is, of course, the next large threat to us. The picture that was shown uh, before um, when I was introduced showed me in an interview with a TV station called Russia Today uh, when we, uh, as the CCC, tried to, uh, decided to sue uh, the German government and the US government for mass surveillance. That was something we can actually do. Um, and it was very, I mean, this made also quite international news because it's very rare that um, one hacker sues another hacker for hacking. 
Um, the irony was, I think, obvious to most people. So this was uh, this was debated all over the world. But I don't have it in here because that 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 case is not yet closed. So um, I want to talk about something that happened earlier, and which is the German data retention law. And here you see people demonstrating the data retention law in Germany somewhere. I, I just got these pictures off the internet, so maybe they are, and maybe they are even in Austria, <laughs> to be honest. So what happened? How did they come up with the idea of data retention? Germany is part of uh, what is called the uh, European Union. And the European Union has another legislative body that can, um, that can come up with regulations. And these regulations would affect all member states. The idea to do this is uh, they wanted to harmonize uh, the market, the, the, the trade between these uh, countries. So in order to make it easier to facilitate trade between Germany, France and Poland, for, for example, you would want to make sure that they have equal um, legislation with regards to, to trade. And so they decided, well, it would be unfair if a telephone network provider in Germany would have other surveillance rules than a telephone network provider in the Netherlands. So let's make a regulation that all of them have to surveil all their, um, their subscribers at all time and store the data for six months and then it's, uh, then it's harmonized across countries and that's a beautiful uh, regulation. So this regulation was passed and member states are then required to pass this into a national law in each member state. So this is what um, German, Germany did. So we had a German national law that required um, telephone network providers to store all the metadata for uh, six months, I believe, at the time. So they, this means in case of a f mobile phone call, they would store who you are calling and where you are at the time and how long that call uh, took. And this, all this data would be stored in, in databases at the provider and upon a judge's uh, order, um, the, um, the uh, agencies or the police would be able to access that data. And they would always argue that this is to prevent crime, but obviously um, that's not, you know, it's not possible to prevent crime post hoc, right? If a judge, if you need a judge's order to to later look into this data and solve a crime, you cannot actually prevent a crime. So we took this law to the German Supreme Court, and it was ruled unconstitutional in Germany. At that point in time, uh, the law was immediately dropped, so it was ineffective immediately, and um, all our data was not stored anymore. Now, when the Supreme Court rules a law unconstitutional, it basically needs to explain why it is unconstitutional, right? So you write a law and say, well, okay, we're storing everybody's data for six months, and then uh, when we want to see it, we need a judge a court order, and then we can, we can look into this data. Now, when you explain as a, uh, as a Supreme Court justice why that can't be, you're at the same time writing the manual on how to do the, how to do the law right, right? How to make the law pass the test of the Constitution. But for the time being, the law was uh, ineffective. And um, in Austria, activists did exactly the same. They took the law to court. But the Austrian court said, okay, Let's see um, and let's discuss whether this whole EU regulation is even okay. So let's take the whole thing back to the EU and to the EU Supreme Court. And as it turns out, the EU Supreme Court ruled the EU regulation um, unconstitutional. So at that point in time, there was no EU regulation anymore that forced people into uh, having um, data retention laws. Now, it would have been beautiful if, if the story had come to an end at that point. Unfortunately, usually when you win in internet activism, uh, you go back to square one. So now we have 
again, a German law. There is no reason for that law except that um, that policemen are asking for it. Um, there are again people getting ready to to uh, to uh, fight against this law. I think there are four or five com complaints to the uh, Supreme Court again. Um, but this time the law is a bit more sneaky. So they they change the retention periods a little bit, and I think they are now trying to have this pass the the test of the Constitution. So I don't know where this this is going to go. But ob for obvious reasons, we are against um, this idea of uh, mass surveillance. Even collecting this data is just calling is just asking for trouble one once you have these vast amounts of data in central spots obviously people are going to use them and abuse them and they are also going to use this data and ask to use this data for different purposes of course currently they only say well yeah we want this for only in case of capital crime and only in case of terrorism and really re to catch the really really evil guys but once the data is there, you already know that in two years from now, at the latest, there's going to be people asking for using this data to, I don't know, to catch pickpockets. And it's just as impossible to catch pickpockets with this data as it is impossible to catch terrorists using this data. So it's absolutely pointless to collect this data for a law enforcement. State Trojans. Okay, this is um, this is one of one of our favorite um, favorite stories to to some extent. Um, when people started using encryption, every government um, and Germany is no ex uh, no um, exception here is a bit suspicious when people start using encryption, and they are afraid that. Eventually, everybody's using inscription one day, and then how do we surveil people? And then they could say something or communicate in private, and we don't know what they're saying. And that would be a threat to us. Not that it had, not that it had ever been a threat to us while people could be intercepted at all times. But, um, you know, once people can be, can't be intercepted anymore, uh, those in power tend to get a bit nervous. So, um, a couple of communication systems came up in Germany that were not uh, easily intercepted. And the first one of them was uh, encrypted email with uh, PGP. And the other um, that gave German authorities a, a, a headache was Skype. Skype was uh, using an encrypted uh, channel and they did not have, and it was decentralized in the, in the first versions as well. So you couldn't even have a centralized point uh, to intercept. So they were really um, unhappy when people were, that people were using Skype. This is at a time when smartphones were not that big yet. I mean, we had them, but yeah, didn't really play that large of a role at that point in time. So they said, okay, when we want to intercept somebody and they're using encryption, obviously we need to intercept them on their machine, on their computer. Um, and in order to do that, we need a Trojan, a Trojan horse, something that we sneak onto the computer that then helps us to, um, to, to, to intercept the call with the microphone before it is encrypted and sent over the network and to read the encrypted email before it is encrypted and sent. So they went ahead and came up with this law and said, okay, let's do this. And again, it was taken to court and we were presented a new fundamental right. That is something that happens very, very rarely. Um, I think the, 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 the time frame in Germany is like every 20, 30 years, maybe you, get a, you, you manage to get a new fundamental right. And the fundamental right here was the fundamental right to ensure the confidentiality and integrity of information technology systems. Now, we were hoping that this new fundamental right would, you know, take off and would be just as strong and important and as untouchable as the other fundamental rights that we had. Um, unfortunately, the government uh, thought differently and just still created um, a state Trojan. Um, now, the beauty is when the state starts hacking you and when they become, when, when they start distributing malware, 
you are suddenly in the same position as an antivirus researcher. You want to find this malware, identify it, analyze it, and protect people against it. So whenever you put out a virus into the wild, sooner or later, the antivirus manufacturers find out about it. And this time we were the antiviruses, uh, even though we were originally the hackers. So we were waiting for somebody to donate a um, hard drive to us that would, uh, that would have the government's malware on it. And it was, when you call for something like this, be prepared, you get a lot of hard drives. Um, <laughs> this is a very, I mean, this, it happens, uh, very, very often that people come up to us and, you know, they, the Russians are after them and the Americans and, and they have implants in their head and, uh, you know, they have all kinds of crazy stories. So you need to filter a bit. And of course you need to, you know, you need to make sure, you need to understand that somebody that is under, under actual surveillance by the government might even make a bit of a crazy impression on you. So you can't just say everybody's crazy, but you need to find a balance. So there's a lot of work to do, and eventually you find um, a malware that um, is actually a state trojan. And you could tell in this case by the functionalities. So in the earlier court case, there, there were, or the police basically had two legal ideas or legal arguments to deploy a state trojan. One was <laughs> A search, basically, you know, search and seizure laws. Uh, law enforcement agencies, law enforcement agencies can kick in your door and search your room and take your belongings, right? If they if they have a court order. Um, that is of course very very complicated when you do it to a computer because if the computer is not with you um, and the the victim of this search doesn't really notice you have a very complicated case to argue that you're doing a legal uh, search here. The other idea was the intercept idea that I just mentioned. But when you do an intercept Trojan, uh, this Trojan must not have certain functionalities and it must have certain functionalities that are quite interesting and not very common for a Trojan. One of them being the ability to intercept Skype calls. Another being the ability to take screenshots, um, which is a strange thing. Um, I mean, most Trojans can do screenshots, so you can look at the victim's screen and see what they're doing, but you wouldn't want the government to do that, right? They said they want to read my email, so that's fine. You know, if they can, if they manage to build a Trojan that can read my email before encrypting it, that's okay. But if they just photograph my screen, they can photograph all kinds of things that I'm looking at, and they are then touching the core of my um, privacy, which is the screen that I'm looking at right now. Don't look at it. Um, <laughs> the screen that I'm looking at right now must not is not necessarily containing a, an encrypted email to my fellow terrorist friends, which I don't have. So. We, we got a hold on this malware and a couple of our members analyzed it and found out that it had these quite specific functionalities and some more that were actually, oops, illegal. One of them being you could upload a file and have it executed. Now, if the computer is supposed to hold up as evidence in court, it cannot be tampered with by those that hold the evidence against you, right? So if you, I mean, it's, you know, if, if that is supposed to be, um, a piece of evidence against me, and there is proof that the government had access to it and could modify anything that's on there, you basically burn the evidence, at least in, um, in courts that play by the rules. So we built, we found a couple of security vulnerabilities in this, um, in this uh, state malware and built a remote toolkit for it. So this is our little tool to remote control any computer that is infected by German state malware, which was also a very ugly thing because that meant not only did the state get access to your computers, it also opened the access to anybody else who was smart enough to hack a state malware um, like us. So um, that was the end of this uh, state Trojan at the, and there was quite some, there were some political repercussions around it. And 
uh, it ended up again in this little court and then they had a new law written and again they just said basically they did the same thing again and said we want to have the right to to hack computers to search them we want to have the right to um, to hack computers to intercept calls and, and emails. So again, um, my colleagues had to write this expert testimony to the, um, uh, to the Supreme Court in Germany. And unfortunately, uh, this time, it seems like they have very, very, very narrow technical specifications for a state Trojan. In my perspective, these are impossible. It's just a, a, a principle matter. As soon as you modify the evidence, the evidence cannot be evidence anymore. So we, are, we firmly believe that um, the state just cannot and must not hack its victims or its enemies or, who, or our enemies even. But um, at the moment in Germany, the situation seems to be that, that, that there is a very narrow uh, corridor um, where they could do it. So now we are again waiting for um, donations to our hard drive inbox uh, to see uh, what, what they did wrong this time. Because at least with the last hack, I think it, we, we gained about four to five years. I'm not quite sure when, when the... Uh, State Trojan was published and by now this has has grown into quite a sport. Um, there are very uh, skilled uh, malware researchers all over the world um, Some of them living in Berlin, but being from different countries that have collected all kinds of state Trojans from all kinds of countries that were found and just keep publishing them keep analyzing them and keep fighting um, against them on a technical level so of course you always striving for things to be settled on a you know in, on the basis of law so that you have fundamental rights that cannot be touched um, when when this is not the case anymore and your activism uh, is fails in the end uh, you can always still go back to technical activism and that is hacking the state trojans that they deploy on us and building the secure communication systems uh, that we want and need um, obviously, for society, it's better if we were not forced to build these systems, but could just enjoy the fundamental rights. But if we're not granted the fundamental rights, okay, we'll um, provide them ourselves. Now, the last one, uh, this is just, I, I'll try to keep this short, but it's just one of the uh, most beautiful stories from my, uh, from my ex-boss, Markus Beckedahl. Markus Beckerdahl is it's the guy on the right. He founded uh, this independent uh, internet news website, netspolitik.org, in 2004. And at that point in time, yeah, I mean, computers had an internet connection, but many people probably didn't even have an internet connection yet. So it was just now becoming a thing. And he was also one of those that envisioned uh, an interconnected society uh, with all its um, troubles and all its um, new um, new resources that the society could uh, prosper on. But I think, I'm not speaking for Marcus, but I think our main concern was always that this wonderful decentral internet that we were enjoying back in the days, in the 90s and in the early 2000s, um, would sooner or later centralize more and more. So we, I mean, there was, there was a point in time when there were the, the thousand largest websites on the internet and they were about roughly the same size. Now, if you look at the thousand uh, biggest websites on the internet, you have basically Facebook uh, and Google and a couple of other sites. And those are a couple of hundred thousand times as big as the next sites. So there is this very strong an ugly tendency towards centralization and, of course, towards surveillance. And Markus and Andre, who is my uh, who is my successor at Netspolitik.org, I'm very happy that I left there and went into IT security because I'm doing probably a better job in IT security than I did in journalism. And Andre is now doing a tremendous job, so I'm very very happy that uh, I made uh, I made room for him. 
because what Andre did is, um, as an investigative journalist, he um, he takes his time for his stories. He's not a day-to-day -day reporter that you know tries to write the big headlines. He's researching on things. He's writing his articles over days and weeks, and then blasts like a strong one um, with like a new information that nobody had before and leaked information in this case. So he released the concept of uh, our the, the interior secret service of Germany um, for internet surveillance. And this is a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, piece of paper where you see exactly how much money and how many personal resources they are calculating for this task. And the beauty about this is if you see what they are planning to do, what they're trying to get money for, and how many people they are going to give which task, um, then you already know what they can do at the moment. So basically, like from your, from your planned future investments, I know what your current status is. So this is why it was quite uh, painful to them, and was why it was also, I think, very important uh, for us to know what capabilities uh, the, the Secret Service uh, deploys um, in surveilling uh, us in the end. Hans-Georg Maaßen, the head of the German Interior Secret Service, was not very happy. He was not amused. He, ne he rarely laughs, but uh, in this picture he also doesn't laugh. <laughs> so he said, well, let's, uh, let's do something against this. Um, let's file a, a, a criminal complaint for treason. And treason is also funny. If you're charged with treason, um, I, in most c uh, countries, I think there is even the death penalty on that. In Germany, it's just you're going to go to jail uh, very, very long. So, fortunately, there was a very strong uh, media echo on this. So, he had probably hoped uh, that the journalists would just you know, be afraid and chicken out and tell them who the source is. But they did not. And um, it became uh, main news all over Germany. And this was the best that could ever happen to netspolitik.org because they had so many visitors that their site went down. And I had to create a different site called uh, treason.org uh, where we would uh, provide the, the, the leaked materials and draw more uh, attention to them. And this is again one of, the, one of the cases where you see that every once in a while the air gets thin. Of course nobody wants a journalist to go to jail for a treason. But here you see a blog post by uh, Kai Gnifke, Grifke, Gifke, who is um, the head of Tagesschau, the largest German uh, news outlet or TV news outlet. And he basically writes, well, yeah, um, you know, we, we are in solidarity with these journalists and we discuss with our lawyers whether we could make these materials, you know, put these materials online uh, as an act of solidarity, but our um, lawyers advise us not to. And that is the largest uh, news site in Germany, um, state-sponsored even. Now, in this site, uh, landesverrat.org, that I just showed you, you know, it's not very beautiful because it's just, I just quickly put it together. Uh, there is an imprint and that has my uh, name and the CCC's address in there. So in this, at this po uh, short point in time, we were a bit more courageous than uh, the largest news outlet in Germany. Now, there was of course also a demonstration for fundamental rights and press freedom. And here you see Markus and Andre with their uh, PGP fingerprint asking for more leaks uh, to be sent to them on a demonstration in Berlin. And as you can see, they, they didn't look as scared because by then this had been on main news for three days in a row. It had been headline news uh, and they had received donations in, in the range of like, I don't know, more than 100,000 euros. So it was also, also financially played well for them. But you also want political repercussions, right? I, we believe that it is unheard of to fight against independent journalists 
um, that have leaked documents that are of interest to the public. I think it is not only of interest to, of, of interest to the public, but a fundamental right of the public to know about the capabilities of its secret services. You know, to at least know whether or not you're being surveilled or not. And apparently, uh, they, they try to keep this secret, and I think I'm very much with um, Edward Snowden on, on this point. At least we want a public debate, and obviously, of course, we don't want it at all. But doing it in secret certainly um, does not comply with the democratic principles that um, I have been taught in school when I went there as a child. So we wanted political repercussions. Um, we would have liked to, to see Hans-Georg Maasner resign or the Minister of Justice. We only got the Prosecutor General, but at least uh, somebody uh, had to resign over this matter. So this is the couple of stories I wanted to tell here. Um, and I can tell a lot more, um, maybe when we, uh, when we are in the panel discussion or later open uh, to questions. I want to briefly finalize what are the lessons learned of more than 30 years of internet freedom activism in Germany. I think the main strength of the Chaos Computer Club is that we are, that it is hard to portray us as evil because we do good and people report about us as doing good to society. Part of that is also that every once in a while we, we are um, expert witnesses to the, to the government itself, trying to, trying to support them in building secure systems, trying to support them in their lawmaking, trying to support them in um, taking our society to the next uh, millennium, which they haven't done yet. So in general, you need to be good so that you can't be portrayed as evil, even if they try to tell you that you are I don't know, uh, in favor of child pornography. Uh, you can win this uh, discourse, but only if you have the reputation to do so. Um, you need to open up to create a large community. Um, you don't want to be only the nerds uh, sitting in a basement with a computer screen. To be honest, most of CCC is obviously exactly that. Yeah, of course. Um, but. We're, we're, we're trying to share our knowledge with everybody, be it at the Congress where we have a colorful uh, community and teach people, be it in our hacker spaces themselves. Um, we still have a long way to go here and I think I would like to have this um, community even more diverse, but the, the most important part is that it's uh, great, that it's large. Um, and yeah, diverse, I put this as a, as a as a separate point, um, you, you want to be diverse so that you are, are not... Basically, diversity um, gives you better creativity and better means to reach your goals, and it also gives you um, less attack points, because if you're fighting for internet freedom, you are going to be subject to one or, one or the other ugly attack, be it treason, um, be it uh, child pornography, you, you need to fence off a lot of uh, things that are thrown your way. And the most important part to keep up the spirits is that you're guided by fun, freedom and decency. Decency with, e with each other and creativity in a group. You know, most of the time we, we don't spend sitting around and about discussing the next law we want to get rid of. Most of the time we're playing with 3D printers and uh, colorful things and LEDs and uh, trying to build radios or whatever, build something, create, make and have fun things, you know, build free internet access for people. You know, we have a refugee situation in Germany at the moment, lots of people needing our support in getting internet access. So here we are and it's fun, you know, climbing roofs and putting up antennas. Never compromise on your goals. You know, you can, do, you can let others do that. You, you can have parties uh, that then join, you know, join the parliament and they need to compromise and that's fine. And, you know, it's a, it's a significant and relevant part of the democratic process. But as activists, 
um, there's no need for you to compromise. And finally, be competent and cooperative. Um, I don't think the CCC would have gotten as far as it has gotten uh, without being cooperative every once in a while. I've done five expert testimonies to the German um, parliament on matters of IT security. And every time I was giving them the best of advice. Um, and so far they learned that I did a few years later because they didn't listen to me. So maybe uh, sooner or later they might listen to me. But it's very important to be um, to have this this competence and this cooperate cooperativeness to then uh, collect support and connections to to those in in the relevant positions when uh, you really really need to do something. Yeah, I guess there's a lot I didn't tell, um, and I'm I would like to finish now and open this up. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to our panel discussion. Uh, we have uh, the panels tonight. Uh, Charles Mark, the Legislative Councillor from the IT sector. Uh, S. Lang, uh, the Director of uh, Internet Society, who is also a security expert in Hong Kong. And uh, Hoa Wong, uh, who is also a member of the, uh, of the Internet Society Hong Kong, who is also an experienced developer. And also, finally, Ken Lam, who is the convener of the Internet Application Development Working Group, uh, working group and also a member of the Internet Society Hong Kong. So, you may begin. Uh, th thank you very much for joining us today. This is a very wise uh, uh, talk uh, we organized. Uh, we, we met uh, Linus uh, two days ago. And then we start organize this event because uh, we think uh, all his share, his share that is very valuable for Hong Kong people, especially for us who care about internet freedoms and democracy. So uh, we invite Leonard to join us and share his experience in Germany. So uh, today we, we have uh, different people here, uh, security expert, developer, and legislator. So uh, I think let's start with a uh, security expert about how we uh, take the experience from uh, German, Germany. Yeah. I think it's, uh, first I, I'd like to thank uh, Ken for picking up this opportunity to invite uh, Linus to, to this meeting. In fact, uh, this is a, a very good lesson for, for us. Uh, I, uh, take this opportunity to, to share some of the views uh, I, I have in Hong Kong. Um, uh, I, I work for information security. Our mission is to secure the infrastructure, the data for users, and of course, uh, privacy as well. But I find that uh, we, as security professionals, become more and more difficult in our uh, life. Firstly, um, we were fighting with cyber criminals before, but the, the world now become more complicated. And uh, sometimes we are not fighting against criminals at all. Maybe after Snowden uh, disclosure, we need to fight with the authority, usually that support us to fight against the criminals. So, so uh, at all ends, we face enemies. And uh, sometimes we have uh, uh, hacktivists. Sometimes hacktivists are our friends. So, some hacktivists will uh, uh, fight against authority to, uh, to preserve the freedom and uh, uh, expression, uh, freedom of expression. But sometimes we find hacktivists also exposing uh, private information. And they are no difference from a criminal at all. So the world is becoming very messy for us. And it's hard that sometimes, like uh, the uh, side exam example is, they have, uh, especially authority, have very good reason to impose restrictions because they say they are uh, for the good of, of parents or, or citizens. But on the other hand, any 
so-called uh, kind restrictions turn out to be uh, surveillance and they take a lot of uh, information from us. The second thing I find difficult is people, some people buy into that. Uh, parents accept parental control. And uh, some people unknowingly buy into that. For example, some people buy the cheap phones that they, well, uh, they can use uh, a phone uh, $6,000, 7000 or they can also use that it causes them only $1,000. Then, but for those $1,000 phone, they have a lot of other services. It's automatic backup for you uh, to somewhere. And uh, you don't know what your data will be used in the future. And it's hard, it's hard for you, even for us doing information security. It's hard for us. Are, are we going to reverse engineer the firmware of every phone, every device we use? We can't, we, we don't know. So, um, I will, I, I frankly tell you that even as a, a, as a professional in this area, we have a lot of difficulty uh, nowadays to, pres to preserve the freedom and also pri uh, privacy. But um, I like uh, uh, what Linus tell is uh, we still have a lot of uh, things that we have now. For example, they have the constitution, the rule of law, the court. Uh, these are the things that we should value and protect. And in Hong Kong, there are a lot of uh, politi political forces trying to um, uh, to uh, damage the rule of law and also uh, the, the court. And I think this is, besides the democracy, I think the rule of law is quite important to Hong Kong. And second is to be open and sharing. Um, hackers, cyber criminals do a lot of sharing. Governments don't do sharing. I think if we do sharing, is uh, we are on the, uh, on the upside if we do more sharing. They are more on the secret side. They have a lot of uh, resources. and But if we do sharing, we can uh, share information, share skills, and uh, share technology, and uh, work with other people. How people uh, in other places like Germany do, uh, in Europe do, and, uh, and we can uh, help ourselves. And transparency, again, transparency is quite important. Um, authority have a lot of reason to, uh, sometimes uh, with good reason, to fight crimes. So they get information from IS, uh, ISPs and so on. And we don't know whether those uh, uh, demands or uh, requests are uh, uh, legible, but um, like what we have now with Google and others, uh, service provider transparency report, uh, is a, a tool that can balance the power that uh, uh, the authority have over us. So, thank you. I don't have much to say, but I want to add one point. So even your phone may be a little bit ex more expensive than others, doesn't mean you are well protected. A few years ago, the CCC has successfully breached the iPhone 5S print of it. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Ken, for organizing this and Linus for coming over. Uh, when I looked at uh, the sharing of experience uh, of what happened in Germany, I uh, can echo a couple of similar but uh, not so dramatic uh, 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 similar situations that happened in Hong Kong. When you talk about, for example, uh, censorship, I still remember about uh, five years ago, our government, when they were consulting a piece of law about obscene control of obscene and indecent articles, uh, which was basically our porno anti-pornography law, drafted very much uh, about the old printed stuff. Uh, and they were trying to update it for the internet age. And uh, they talked about trying to implement mandatory filtering. And uh, at that time, uh, we uh, fought against it. And uh, the government said, no, don't worry, because look at Australia, they are doing it. 
And we said, uh, no, we looked at the internet. We don't think Australia is really doing it. They went so far as to telling us lies about what other governments were trying to do. And uh, fortunately for Internet Society, we had uh, friends in Australia and we looked up uh, Internet Society Australia and asked them what's happening. And basically they told us that no, you know, basically the government, uh, you know, tried to push this and uh, first of all, uh, uh, it was technically infeasible and uh, not feasible and so they pull, pull back. Secondly, uh, in fact, that government eventually got ousted anyway. So the new government, uh, you know, moved on, and uh, and they don't do the, they, they they don't push that agenda anymore. So that was our first confrontation with an attempt in Hong Kong to put in mandatory filtering at the ISP level. That was about four to five, uh, five, five or six years ago. The first task of Gregory So, and uh, anyway, uh, we stopped him. Uh, and uh, the sec the second uh, thing that uh, uh, I wanted to echo from what uh, Linus shared about was about surveillance uh, because in Hong Kong uh, uh, we, we actually do have some legal safeguard against surveillance by our citizens, well, by our government and uh, that is in the form of a legislation called the Interception of Communications and Surveillance Ordinance, ICSO. Uh, but again, it was drafted sort of pre-internet and they were really talking about, you know, they were really thinking about why, why tapping phones, you know, uh, uh, and, and that sort of uh, uh, things. But in this day and age, uh, you know, even if you were a real criminal or, or not, you know, you would be probably, uh, if I want to talk with Ken and try to make a scheme, you know, I probably would be doing it over email or WhatsApp. So the government decided that actually they uh, don't even have to follow the strict safeguard under the law because they, under the ICSO, the, this ordinance, they have to go to a panel judge, a special panel, to get clearance before they undertake this kind of wiretapping type of surveillance activities. And, uh, and also, besides that, they also have to file annual reports and, uh, and so on. And they have a whole series of uh, uh, guidelines about what they can do and cannot do. But they decided that today, since most of you do all, all these things over the internet anyway, I could just simply get a warrant, or sometimes they don't even get a warrant, and go to the internet service providers and, uh, and ask them to turn over the records. And they said, well, because this is not in the course of communication, so this is simply collection of evidence. And they totally bypassed the spirit and the letter of the law of the ICSO. And uh, for two years, we in the legislature up to now have been forcing, trying to get our security bureau, our police and our government to tell us simply how many times they have been asking internet service providers for these sort of personal data or information with a warrant and without a warrant. And for two years, the government told us, you know what the answer was? We don't keep that record. And they said, okay, if you've never kept that record for the last how many years, can you start doing it now for the next three months? You know, we asked them that during the last summer break. So by the time October, we came back here and we asked them, what have you done? Have you collected the data? They said, we don't keep that data. Again, I don't know, maybe we should give them more money so they can hire people to just simply count the numbers of cases. But anyway, uh, to us, that means they have something to hide which is that usually they don't even use a warrant to get information from the internet service provider. You know, I see some of the internet service provider here nodding the, his head. So maybe that's the case, right? No, okay, you don't have to comment. But anyway, so looking at this uh, sort of uh, experience that he shared, you know, we could echo some of these experiences. The only thing is, uh, is uh, actually a question I like to ask Linus, you know, how do you guys come up with all that money to sue the government, take them to court? Because I think there are a lot of these cases that I think we probably have a decent case to uh, try to fight against our government uh, in some of their practices. But the problem is, if we, we take them to court, it will cost us a lot of money, we may lose, and we have to pay the other party's bill, and so on. But so legal uh, pursuit is very expensive. Uh, how do you guys manage to do that in Germany, to come up with your organization being financially capable of doing that? Um. It's 
it, it works the following way. Um, first of all, there is a membership fee. So um, <laughs> every, but this is very, this is very low. That, that would be in the five, five euro range, I think, for the. Uh, a lot of money. No, no, that's not a lot of money. Uh, the the idea, you know, how the way you you make money is by not paying people for their work. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Every uh, every activism uh, as the CCC for the CCC and by the CCC is not being paid for. So I am not. I am a, a voluntary. Uh, I'm voluntarily in this position, and I don't receive any money for it. Um, the other part is when you do these events. Uh, these like a 12,000 people congress that thing you probably wouldn't be able to, uh, we wouldn't be able to pay for if we were paying um, the people that do it so we have a, a voluntary um, aid program so basically people can sign up at the door to help and um, by doing so like if you you know if they spend like eight or eight hours working for the Congress, there you receive a shirt. I'm wearing one of these shirts today. <laughs> so that's... You earn it. And they, by, by doing that, we're keeping the ticket prices low. Yeah, right? So, we, I mean, the Congress, I think last year's Congress was a, a 90 euro standard ticket for a four day event. So it's ridiculously uh, cheap, but we had more than a thousand uh, voluntary helpers that weren't really being paid. So had we had to pay uh, those people, the entrance fee would have probably been in a couple of like four to 500 euros. So in your legal system, the yeah, I'm get, I'm getting so, so that's how we get money. So that's how we get money. So you, you can't really, I mean, if you, if you do these events, you need to calculate with a safety cushion. And then eventually we have, yeah, we have some financial funds in the end and then we can decide to spend them on litigation, for example. Yet then we probably end up with um, lawyers that are also doing this for, for free for their cause. So that's how eventually you get the cost frame to, to a range that is uh, worth it, you know, that's worth the risk. So, I mean, you, you don't sue for things that you, that you know you're not going to win. Um, and we have other, uh, basically we're running court cases in, in the UK and in Germany at the moment, if I got them all together. They tend to take so long, right? They, years and years, and you don't know what, like which court are we suing in front of again, whom. Um, CCC is not running the UK one. One of your activists is one of the four yeah, Constanza, uh, Constanza is running the one in the UK, but there, there no, were two... No, no, she's not. The Open Rights Group, English Pen and Big Brother Watch are running it. She's one of the other. She's the fourth plaintiff. She's okay. Not, she's not running it. See, that's why I didn't want to get into it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but there's an important point. Most of the time, um, the setup is that other people are running the cases so that we can be the, the expert witnesses in court. No, I'm the expert witness. She's a plaintiff. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's important to get the details right. But, you know, but I, wasn't, I wasn't talking about your case, though. You, you were, just a minute ago. No, you were. Okay. So, what, what, what do I need to say? In, in this case, um, one of our members who is not uh, doing this as in her position as the CCC spokesperson, her name is Constanze Kurz, is a plaintiff in a case with four other groups in the UK. And in the in this court case, the man, the gentleman over there, is the expert witness. Did I get that right? Yes. Was that correct, now? Yes. Okay. Other court cases at the moment, um, we usually try to get into the position of either see, you know secretly funding them, or um, being the uh, the expert witnesses, or finding uh, lawyers that that also do this for for free. So the legal risk is, um, or the, the financial risk is, is not the issue.
So uh, actually, this is what I want to ask, but uh, thanks, Charles. So um, before we, we move on to the four, four questions, I, I want to ask how many computer clubs in, in Germany? How many, how many this kind of hackers uh, organization clubs in, in Germany. Germany? Because when you are organizing a, a uh, 12,000 uh, uh, converts, it is a huge event which if we do it in Hong Kong, actually, uh, I shall always try to do this kind of event, but we, the maximum of uh, participants, we got only 700 people. So, how, how, many, how many groups organize this kind, this kind of uh, hacker events? Or so, the, the Congress, um, one thing you must know is that it grew over 32 years into, into this size. And it was only recently, uh, I think, so like six or seven years ago that it attracted uh, so many more people. So it started out with a couple of, you know, maybe 100, couple of hundred uh, visitors and then slowly grew to around a thousand, thousand something visitors. Um, then eventually we filled um, and we moved on to larger venues um, every, every other, uh, every couple of years. So you don't just have a 12,000 visitor event, it, you know, you have a 12,000 visitor event because you have 30 years of history behind this event. And it's only recently that it grew so large. We moved to Hamburg with 29 C3 and we, we are currently planning 30 C, 33 C3. So it's only been this large for the past two years. And um, I just have a question in my mind that uh, I think CCC have been, has been there for like around a few decades, right? And then every time you're doing something, something, something great to the society, like you're trying to mess up with the Germany Bank and the LASA and the KGB and also the NSA. Every time you're going to do something great, you're going to put yourself into the spotlight. So my question would be, how how do you member feel like uh, am I really scared? And nowadays, even the Indian network is also being monitored somehow. Um, interesting question. Now, um, one thing that's important, <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad for the chance to to make this disclaimer, is that most of the time, um, you know, when it comes to uh, things that could be illegal, those who actually did it never see a camera. So they are, they are mostly unknown. You know, some, sometimes we can't really manage it, but the, the team that analyzed the state Trojan is basically unknown. Some of, the, some of the team people have been, you know, exposed or have exposed themselves, but um, most of them, the larger part of the team is, is still unknown. So um, you have the uh, the spokespeople that then, you know, speak up front and oftentimes they know about things but they are not actually involved. And most of what we're doing we don't consider illegal, so it's not that, that big of a problem. Of course, you know, you mentioned hacking the iPhone, that was a fun thing to do for my friend Starbuck. So, um, but he's for, he for example was not he didn't want to handle all the media inquiries, so somebody else had to do it. He, he just wanted to do it and be done. Um, so there is a, um, there is a uh, distribution of, of, of what people do. Um, to, as, when it comes to surveillance, yeah, of course, I think I'm, I'm being surveilled, but probably not for my political activism, but rather for what I do in my, in my day job, um, which is general security research, so that always attracts people's uh, interest. But I've had no troubles traveling the world so far, and that can be a good sign or a bad sign, I don't know. Uh, let's move on to the floor for questions.